All right, it looks like we still have some folks who are still logging on and joining, but I'm going to go ahead and kick us off today. We're going to go through a little bit of housekeeping business up at the top of the webinar before Emma dives into our Health and Decarb 101 training for today. So welcome all. And I am recording this meeting um, so that we can share it on our YouTube channel afterwards just for folks who aren't able to join us live. So welcome, welcome. If you are new to the Midwest Building Decarbonization Coalition, a little bit about us here at the top. So our mission at Midwest BDC is to develop and implement equitable strategies to achieve zero emissions from the Midwestern building sector by 2050. And we define our kind of Midwest priority states as this eight state region of Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, Wisconsin, Ohio, Missouri, Indiana, and Iowa. We have tons of folks who participate from outside of this region, but this is kind of where we focus our Midwestern works. We know the Midwest can mean something else to tons of different people. And we like to practice these community norms in our meeting and webinar spaces. So I'm gonna go ahead and read through these real quickly. And this is just something that we ask um, that everyone kind of abides to in the chat. And then also we might have some opportunities for folks to come on screen um, and ask their questions live today. So just keep these in mind. They are notice intent, lean towards impact, use I statements, assume good intentions, on screen, off screen, that means um, no requirement for on screen or off screen. We know sometimes people are multitasking or in transit or something like that. No worries if that's the case. Practice self awareness. Ask yourself, wait, why am I talking or why aren't I talking? Practice active listening. Stop and witness. Listen for understanding, not to respond. Remember that everyone's a teacher and everyone's a learner. We ask that everyone shares responsibility for keeping to these norms. Adhere to speak next indicators on Zoom. Um, we like to use that raise hand function. So that's what we will use. Um, if a couple people want to speak, we'll go in that order. Show up in your authentic self. Speak to the whole group. Minimize the use of jargon and explain terms when you are asked. And participate and lean into discomfort. All right. And that's really all I have from the Midwest BDC side of things. So now I'm really excited to introduce our trainer for today, Emma Hines. Emma is the Senior Associate of Carbon Free Buildings at RMI and also our Midwest BDC Health Working Group Leader. So Midwest BDC members, you're probably familiar with Emma. But if not, I'm going to read her bio real quick and then let her take it away. So Emma comes to RMI with a wealth of climate change and public health expertise in research, communications, technical assistance, coalition building, and education. She has served as a member of the teaching faculty and instructional team for the Climate Change and Health Online Certification Program with the Yale School of Public Health for two years. Prior to joining RMI, Emma participated in a two-year fellowship with the Climate and Health Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. In this position, she conducted climate change and public health research, created guidance documents and communications materials, and provided technical assistance to state and local public health departments. So welcome, Emma. I'm going to let her take it away and share her screen now. Thanks so much, Maggie. It's always funny when people read a bio that you wrote three years ago, because I get a reminder of what exactly uh, is written about me on the internet. But thank you for that. I'm gonna share my screen now with folks. Um, Maggie, could you let me know if this looks great on your end? Yep, you look good to go. Cool. So hi everyone, I'm really glad that you all joined today for this Health and Decarbonization 101 webinar. This is one that I have given a couple times now for the Midwest BDC over the last couple of years that I have been affiliated. I always think it's a really fun one to give, so I'm glad to see some new names as well as some familiar names from the Health Working Group. Um, Maggie did a lot of the work for my intro, but just to make sure that everyone knows where I'm coming from, I am speaking to you today uh, both as the Midwest BDC Health uh, Working Group lead, but also as a staff person over at RMI, which is formerly Rocky Mountain Institute. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization working to accelerate the clean energy transition. Like Maggie said, I work on our carbon-free buildings team, meaning that all of our work is geared toward transitioning away from fossil fuels in our building sector in favor of clean, green, and healthy energy sources. And in this presentation, I'm obviously going to be diving into that health component, 
especially as it relates to gas stoves. So hopefully you all are ready to talk about stoves a little bit. So the agenda for today is that we're going to start off by doing a really quick activity in the chat just to get a little bit of engagement from the folks that have joined today. Um, and that's going to be broken up into five questions that I'll go over in just a second here. But then past that, my slides are going to focus on three main things. First, the problem with burning fossil fuels and what the health and air quality impacts are in our homes. Then we're going to move forward and talk about decarbonization and electrification as a solution. And then we'll finish by talking about some recent developments on this topic over the past year. I really wanted to add this section in this rendition of the presentation because a lot has changed since I last presented on this for the coalition. So I think this will be interesting to folks who have seen my earlier slides and want to know, you know, what's happened since I last talked about this. And then, of course, um, time permitting, we'll finish up with a Q&A or discussion based on what um, parts of this felt interesting to you all. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and transition us into our quick activity for today. Like I said, I'm gonna ask five pretty simple questions of the group, and I'm hoping that you all can answer these in the chat for today. I might have an opportunity for us to come off of mute and maybe answer some of these questions live if you're interested, but we can take it one step at a time. So the first question that I am really interested in getting your input on is what kind of stove or oven combo do you have in your home right now? The answers that I'm anticipating here are that you might have electric or induction only, you might have gas or propane only, or you might have some combination of the two. That could look like a gas cooktop, maybe with a separate electric stove. So I want to hear from folks, what are you using? So looking through the chat, I see a good mix of both. I see a lot of electric only, a lot of gas only, a couple combos. So I am interested in that too, to see the gas and electric by renter or by homeowner. Do folks wanna raise a hand if you wanna chime in and give a little input on why you use what you're using? It could be uh, a matter of whether you had a choice in choosing or not. Like if you're a tenant, maybe you didn't have a choice. Anyone want to raise a hand and just give us a little insight about why? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. We might stick with the chat then and that's okay. I'm going to read out some of these. Oh, Linda, go ahead. Come off mute if you're able. Um, I'm a homeowner and my house came with electric cooktop oven and the like however <laughs> i'm a cook and i like gas <laughs> but i hear I that can... linda yeah a lot of folks <laughs> have a preference for I... gas because of the way if, it I had, if my house could have accommodated gas i would have switched but um i had somebody to come out and it didn't work okay well i, I appreciate hearing that input but it sounds like you had electric because that's what you moved into. I'm seeing yeah. that a couple more times in the chat as well. It was in the home that we purchased. Um, homeowner, that's what came with the house. Um, anyone else want to come off of mute and share with the group why you use what you use currently? Let's do Thomas. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I use a gas stove um because i'm a renter but i am actively trying to get to convince my landlords to switch um just because i'm concerned about indoor air quality and i think there's a business case that i can make to my land landlord about making the switch i think more people are becoming aware that they shouldn't have gas stoves in their homes and and for future renters, I think it it makes sense for this apartment to have like an induction stove instead. Yeah, thanks for jumping in and sharing that. Really interesting to hear that you're trying to work on getting the owner of that property to switch along with you. And I see another message from Jessica in the chat that they're a homeowner, they've used electric because it's there when they purchased the home, but grew up using gas, planned to switch to it, but with all the information coming in over the last two years, they now plan to switch to induction when they upgrade, which is really awesome to hear that. 
Um, and for folks who use gas, I definitely don't mean for this presentation to be, um, you know, making any commentary about the choice that you have or not the choice that you had. A lot of folks just use what was in the apartment or the home when they moved in. And I'll share up front too, I personally have a gas stove in my home, but I hope that what folks come away with from this presentation is just a better understanding of what some of the health risks are of cooking with gas and some of the really practical steps that folks can take in their home to protect their air. So that's just a level setting um, comment that I wanted to make up front in this presentation, but I'm going to go ahead and move us on to our next question, which is about ventilation. I'm curious, how often do you use your range hood to ventilate when you cook? I'm anticipating one of the following types of answers. I don't have one. I don't usually use the range hood. Sometimes I use it or every single time. So go ahead and throw your answer into the chat. Okay, I'm seeing a huge range of answers here as well from majority of the time, every time, I don't have one, very little. Anyone wanna jump in and give a verbal response to this one? Just raise your hand. Eleanor. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so I'm a renter and I don't have one, um, but I guess my perspective is I really wish that I did have one. Um, it seems like uh, it cannot be good that I am cooking with no sort of ventilation. Sometimes I'll try and open a nearby window, um, but I would say that that is something that I am not uh, happy with. <laughs> and I have a gas stove, by the way. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. I hear that. I feel like a lot of folks have lived in places that just don't have ventilation or, you know, I'm seeing in the chat a couple of folks also mentioning they do have it, but it's not the type that vents outside. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment here. Um, let's do a prilly next if you're able to come off mute. Greetings. Um, thanks. So just wanted to share that um, I'm not sure where my vent um, leads to, um, in my apartment, but I generally, um, just don't feel so great about the vent system, um, over my food when I'm cooking. So I just open windows and I'm really interested in, um, learning more about that if I should be using it more. So thanks. Yeah, thanks for sharing that input. We will definitely talk a little bit more about the pros and cons of ventilation here in a bit in my presentation, but hopefully um, we will get more and more folks using their vent hood more often than not, regardless of what type of stove you're cooking on, because there are definitely some really important reasons to be using your vent hood. So that's question number two. Thanks for your input. I'm going to keep us moving here. Instead of talking about you all as an audience now, these next questions are going to ask about your understanding of what's been going on nationwide. So the third question for you is what kind of stove do you think the majority of Americans prefer to cook on? Uh, answers maybe being electric induction, gas propane, or if you're really not sure, feel free to just let us know that. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of responses for gas rolling in. Yes, Daniel, people do love their gas. <laughs> okay, so people seem to be pretty tightly answering gas um, pretty through and through, but induction if they have it. Love that comment, Don. We will definitely talk a little bit more about induction specifically in a bit here. We do have answers to this question, so I'm going to share that in just a moment here. But the next question, just to keep us moving, is what kind of stove do you think the majority of Americans actually cook on? Electric, gas, or not sure? Okay, I'm seeing a lot more electric here. I think you all are onto something. You said a mix. Okay, that's probably fair, Brian. Maybe I should have put a mix as the answer here. But we have answers to this too. So I'm going to respond to this in just a moment here. I just wanted to get you all thinking and interested in the presentation content. So I'm going to move us on to our final question. And I am going to ask if folks want to chime in for this one as well. Uh, in 2023 or 2024, did you see any media coverage about gas stoves? 
anticipating answers like not at all, maybe you don't consume news, you saw some coverage, saw lots of coverage, or you read every single article that came out about this and shared it with your peers. Let me know, did you see any coverage? Okay, <laughs> a big range of answers here too. Anyone wanna come off mute and share, especially if you're someone who read a lot? I'm curious to hear from you. Thomas. Um, yeah, so in 2023, I was in graduate school and I feel like this was sort of relevant to my studies. And so I was hyper aware of the, the news related to like studies, new studies about uh, gas stoves. Um, so <laughs> I guess I became a little freaked out about it. And so I like sought out articles about it um, where I could. And I shared it with loved ones who have the, who are homeowners and have the ability to make upgrades. Um, but I will say, I, I think it wasn't covered as much as I expected it to be based on like how serious of an issue I thought it was. Thanks for that input. You're actually not the only person to in the chat who said that you read and shared, but you were the one who were, you were seeking it out. I saw someone else also said that you saw some coverage, but you were looking for it. Um, I'm curious for folks who started mentioning things about like where they were seeing this coverage. Were you all seeing this more in like local news coverage or more in national news sources? You can put that in the chat or come off mute if you're interested in sharing. Seeing national from Carrie. Anyone else want to chime in with where you saw this kind of news? National. Okay. Yeah, I see from Alexander and a couple other folks mentioned that you were mostly seeing this media coverage in relation to the idea of banning gas stoves. That is certainly something that I will spend some time talking about towards the end of my presentation in the development section. So I'm glad that some folks have brought this up. But thank you everyone for engaging in this uh, couple of questions that I had for you all. Hopefully it's gotten you interested in some of the content that we're gonna go over together. And it's also given me a sense of where you all are coming to this conversation from, what your preferences are, what you know versus not know as much about. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right into the content, starting with the, the problem that I set you all up with, which is that we are cooking with gas but should we be? So I'm gonna have a couple of gifts here and there to split up the sections. Hopefully they make you giggle a little bit later on. This one's just someone cooking on gas. But before we answer that should we be question, I wanted to get grounded with a reality check on what people are actually cooking with across the US. So this is a map of all of the US states with the share of households that use natural gas cooking appliances. And I think the big takeaway here is that gas is actually not the most common fuel over electricity these days when it comes to cooking appliances. Nationally, gas stoves are used in about a third of households, but like you can see here, that usage is really highly dependent on state. This calls out DC where 62% of households have gas cooking appliances, but a couple others I'll point out are California with 70% of households using gas. New York and Illinois are also big hotspots. Um, generally, you're going to see that the Midwest, where you all are from, is a little bit more of a hotspot than some other areas of the country. Uh, but on the lower end, states like Florida only have about 8% penetration of gas stoves. So this is the answer to that question, where really electric is more common right now. But let's go into preferences. There is a lot on this slide, so I'm going to break it down piece by piece here. Um, but people generally have very strong opinions about their stove because out of all of the appliances in their home, this is really the one that they are very familiar with. And it's because we use them every day. I think most people don't care as much or don't know as much even about the other home appliances like their HVAC system or their water heater, for example, because those are often tucked away in a closet or in the basement, the attic. But the stove is really like the centerpiece of a lot of people's kitchens, they use them every day. So this poll has started to look into 
um, American sentiments towards gas stoves. And this was done by Data for Progress, just that you all know where this is coming from. And this is from 2023, so last year. The poll asked about sentiments two different times for American adults. First, they asked um, with no information given uh, if you were to purchase or if you were in the market to purchase a new stove in the next decade, what would you purchase? And that initial ask across all American adults, they got about 36% of folks saying that they would choose gas if they were to make that choice in the next decade. And uh, the rest were opting for electric or induction. What was interesting about this poll in particular is that then they followed up that initial ask with a little bit of education about the health risks of cooking with gas. And they asked again, and they're calling this the informed ask. And what you're gonna see here is that that preference for gas dropped from 36% to 27% after they did that little bit of education. Well, the next two lines of data here that you'll see labeled as gas stove users and electric stove users was a little bit more of a breakdown to see if the numbers change by what folks currently are using in their homes. So unsurprisingly here, you're going to see that for gas stove users, they have a preference for gas stoves um, more so than electric stove users. And that's just coming down to comfort. I think we heard a lot of folks in the chat say, I grew up with gas, so I prefer gas. And that really comes through pretty strong in this data as well. But regardless of whether you were a gas stove user or an electric stove user, there is still that same drop from the initial ask to the informed ask, where fewer people are interested once they learn a little bit about the health risks of cooking with gas. So that's exactly what we're gonna do here today is talk through some of that education on you know what are the health risks, what pollutants are we being exposed to? And maybe we'll get some folks to feel even just a little bit converted at the end of this presentation to thinking that electric might be their next um, choice of stove. So that's what I'm gonna go ahead and transition into now. Um, this information that I'm going to share from, um, from my organization is coming majority from a report that came out in 2020. It has still been a big focus of our work for the last couple of years. We've learned a lot more about this topic since this report came out, but this is really like a fundamental piece of evidence that we have on gas stove pollution. So that's where a lot of this content is going to come from, just for your awareness. And I'm happy to share that link, or maybe Maggie can drop it in the chat if you can find it quickly. But the first thing that I wanted to cover with you all is the types of pollutants that are released in the home when we cook with gas stoves. There are a lot that we could focus on, but I'm going to draw your attention to four of them in particular. Some of these probably sound familiar, others maybe not so much. So I'm going to walk through this piece by piece, starting with carbon monoxide. This is one that I think a lot of folks are familiar with. Um, most people know that it doesn't smell like anything. It's odorless, it's also invisible. Um, but exposure to carbon monoxide, especially in really high doses can be fatal. Um, at more mild exposures or lower level exposures, it can lead to more mild cases of carbon monoxide poisoning. But I think we hear a lot about this when it does reach those fatal levels. One thing that I'll mention though, in the case of gas stoves is that, you know, when we cook on gas every day, sometimes several times a day, you can imagine that we're being exposed to pretty low levels, but every day, you know, that's long-term low level exposure to carbon monoxide. And there are still studies that are starting to investigate those risks because they're a little bit different than the ones that we hear about uh, more regularly, like those big carbon monoxide cases of poisoning and fatalities. But that's one of the pollutants that I think we should pay attention to. The next one is carbon or nitrogen dioxide, sorry, which is NO2, you might hear me refer to it as. This is typically a colorless gas. Um, this one is important because it's a lung irritant. It can inflame the lining of the lungs when humans are exposed to it. And um, it has been linked to asthma development and it can also aggravate respiratory symptoms like if folks already have asthma or some other respiratory conditions. The next pollutant on this list is particulate matter. 
Um, this is any particles in the air. In particular, we're talking about PM 2.5 here, which is the size designation. So this is any inhalable particle that is 2.5 microns in diameter or smaller. There are also other categories of particulate matter. You may hear it referred to as like PM 10. And just so you know, that's again, a size designator. But these are very small particles and the health impacts of this are due to the fact that we inhale them into our bodies and they can penetrate into parts of our bodies like the lung, our lungs, the bloodstream, our brain in some cases when they're small enough, and other organs as well. But PM can be linked to asthma, respiratory inflammation, and even premature death in some cases when it's bad enough. The final pollutant that I wanted to share with you all is benzene. This is one that we've admittedly been learning a lot more about over the last year. So if you're newer to these presentations, this um, is going to be some good information for you to pick up on that's only come out over the last year or so. But this um, is typically a liquid or a vapor. In the case of gas stoves, I'd say vapor. It has been linked with higher cancer risks for folks that have been exposed. And other studies have also found that it has been linked to um, damage to the respiratory, nervous, and reproductive systems. So a pretty wide range of potential health impacts here. So these are the four main ones that I want folks to be aware of, but of course you may see mention of other pollutants as they relate to gas stove emissions, things like methane, formaldehyde, a couple of others as well, but these are the big four. And the next slide that I have for you all is just a little bit of a dive into why indoor air quality matters so much in the first place. Because you know, all of those pollutants are bad for us outdoors as well, but the indoor environment is really a unique one because we spend so much of our time indoors. You know, uh, we have estimates sharing that up to 90% of our time, especially for adults, is spent in inside, which means that we just have a lot of exposure to that indoor air. And the EPA has found that indoor pollutant levels can be anywhere from like two to five to as many as 100 times higher than outdoor pollutant levels. And you may be wondering, well, aren't there a lot of things that contribute to poor indoor air quality? And the answer is yes, there are a lot of things that we do in our home, a lot of products that we have that can contribute to those really high pollutant levels. But we do have evidence showing that homes that have gas stoves in them have 50 to 400% nitrogen dioxide emissions than homes that have electric stoves. And that, you know, that's all to say that gas stoves are a big culprit when it comes to nitrogen dioxide emissions and exposure in the home. So a little bit more detail on nitrogen dioxide here. Again, and there's a lot of numbers on this slide, so I'm going to walk through them bit by bit. But the reason we care so much about nitrogen dioxide is because outdoors in the U.S., we have standards for NO2 that have been set by the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA. But when it comes to indoors, we don't have any guidelines or standards for this pollutant and many, many others. So that means that our indoor air is often unmonitored, like we don't really know what's going on with our indoor air quality, and it's unregulated. So even if there was a problem, there's not much that can be done about it on a larger scale. Other countries like Canada and some international bodies like the World Health Organization do have either guidelines or standards for nitrogen dioxide and other pollutants, but we often just reference those here. We don't, they're not enforced in the U.S. And why this matters is in the context of cooking on a gas stove, certain kitchen activities like baking a cake in your gas oven, even just boiling a pot of water on a gas cooktop can release enough nitrogen dioxide at its peak that it would exceed what's allowable in an outdoor environment. Uh, meaning that those indoor levels would essentially be illegal if they were outside, but because we have no rules on inside, nothing can really be done. So that's why we really care about NO2 and gas stoves in particular. And there are certain populations that are at pretty high risk of exposure to gas stove pollution, one of which is any lower income household. And there are a lot of factors that contribute to these households having higher levels of nitrogen dioxide inside than higher income or higher wealth households. Um, some of those factors are more often than not, folks are living in smaller units, 
There tend to be more people living per home. A lot of times these homes are also on the older side of things, meaning they likely have inadequate ventilation. Like some of the folks we were just hearing from maybe didn't have ventilation at all, or it's the type that just recirculates in their home. We also see in lower income households that folks are more likely to use their stove or their oven for supplemental heat when their heating source isn't adequate to get them through the winter. And then in general, these communities also are already facing higher levels of outdoor air pollution, which of course makes its way inside. And these communities are also facing a greater asthma burden to begin with, meaning that this exposure to the additional gas stove pollution can really lead to additional health harm. So a lot of reason to be focusing in on lower income households. But another population that we hear a lot about is children because of the really well-documented risks to this, this group. So in particular, children living in a home with a gas stove have been found to have a 42% increased risk of experiencing asthma symptoms when compared to children living in a home with an electric stove and a 24% increased risk of being diagnosed with asthma by a doctor over the course of their lifetime. And there are a lot of reasons why children are more susceptible to air pollution than adults. Um, this is things like they have a higher breathing rate, they tend to be more physically active, they have a higher lung surface to body ratio, and their lungs and their entire immune system is also still in the process of maturing and developing over time. So children in particular are another group that we have a close eye on as it relates to gas stove pollution. And this exposure to NO2 in children can lead to a whole host of negative health effects, not just respiratory. Um, it can also lead to IQ learning deficits as well as other cardiovascular effects. So there's a lot that we're learning here still as more research comes out. But the respiratory system is typically what we hear most about. And I'm gonna share the findings of a recent study on this with you all now. Um, this slide is showing uh, the results of a new study. This is from about a year ago, which in the grand scheme of things is still relatively new. This is from my organization, RMI, and some partners between the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the University of Sydney in Australia. Um, together, the researchers on this study found that over 12% of the current childhood asthma burden in the United States can be attributed to gas stove use. And that's approximately 647,000 cases of asthmatic children. In other words, just to phrase this a little bit differently, this is essentially the proportion of childhood asthma that could theoretically be prevented if gas stoves were not present in any homes in the US. So a pretty big staggering number that obviously got a lot of traction in the media when this um, paper came out. The national figure, like I said, is 12.7, but I also included some of the state by state findings here. I think there's nine states listed. And the reason that these numbers vary so much from state to state is I'm going to hearken back to that map that I showed a couple slides back about the reality of where gas stoves are being used. If you remember Illinois and California and New York, actually, were some of those hot spots of gas stove use. So naturally, in those states where there's a lot of gas stove use, there's also a higher fraction of asthma cases that can be attributed to gas stove use. And then, you know, as we move down to the bottom of the list, we see Florida where many fewer cases can be attributed to gas stoves. Sort of makes sense when we explain it in the context of where stoves are commonly used or gas stoves in particular. So that's just a little bit of an update on what we've learned more recently about the connection between childhood asthma and gas stove usage. But one more tidbit that I want to share from that study, again, there's a lot going on on this slide, so I'm going to try and slowly walk through it, is the comparison of gas stove use to other common um, exposures that can influence asthma. So that's possible because of the metric that was used in that study, which is the population attributable fraction, or PAF. Those PAFs are uh, able to be compared across other exposures that influence asthma. So this is a chart from a different study that was graphing the PAF or population attributable fraction for asthma for a couple of different 
asthma influencing exposures. Some of those examples that I'll call out are things like obesity in childhood, uh, RSV infection as an infant, having pets in the home, exposure to traffic pollution, you know, all of those different exposures can lead to um, or can be attributed to asthma, I should say, just to be correct. Um, the exposure that I want you all to pay most attention to is the one that I've highlighted, which is secondhand smoking. And that hangs out at right about a 12% population attributable fraction. And that 12% should sound awfully familiar to the one that I just shared for gas stove use. So what this means is that childhood exposure to secondhand smoking is pretty on par with uh, exposure to gas stove pollution in terms of their influence on childhood asthma. So just one interesting finding that we can take away from the use of that population attributable fraction metric. So this is typically the part of the presentation where folks are asking like, wow, that's a lot of information. What am I supposed to do with this? Um, so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about how we can move from awareness to action. I'm going to start by talking about the household level, since a lot of folks are curious about like, well, what am I supposed to do in my personal home? And then I'm going to turn and talk about policy change a little bit more in the development section of this presentation. So for families who are very inclined and able and then that come able comes down to like financially able and like do you have control over your appliances in your home like if you're a tenant or not um you can theoretically switch your gas stove out for an electric stove of course for many families this makes the most sense to do when your existing stove is at the end of its useful life there are sometimes other opportunities to do this. Like if you're moving homes, maybe you would only consider a home with an electric or induction stove in it. Um, there are also some situations that might encourage you to more rapidly switch out your stove. Like if you have um, a sensitive um, child in the home, like who has asthma, for example, that might encourage you to move a little bit quicker. But of course, it is well understood that the best opportunity to do this is when you need to make a switch in your stove anyways. There are three kinds of stoves that fall into the electric umbrella that you may consider switching to. So I wanted to spend just a moment talking through those for you all. The first at the bottom is the classic electric resistance coil stove. I think this is why people have such a bad um, feeling about electric stoves. I think everyone at some point has cooked on one of these coil stoves and has had just a pretty negative experience with it, or maybe just an okay experience. And that's pretty fair. We rate these as not the best choice because um, there's a couple of additional hazards that I'll point out. One is just how hot those coils can get. I think you're all used to seeing those screaming hot red coils that can actually be a little bit of a um, a hazard, especially if you have like children living in the home who might put a hand on the stove top. But we've also found that these are not as efficient as other electric options. They're a little bit more difficult to clean, so that gives them a bad rap. And we've also seen a little bit of research showing that the really, really high temperatures, if dust falls on them, that it can actually end up creating ultra fine particulate matter. When you compare the pollution potential of a gas stove to an electric resistance coil stove, I don't think that there's any comparison there. Obviously, moving electric is still a better choice, but out of the three choices, not the best. The middle one that a lot of folks also have a lot of experience with is glass smooth top stoves. Um, I personally like these, but I've heard that some people are not the biggest fans. I find that these are easier to clean. These work by transferring heat to the um, cookware on top using um, hot coils that are covered by a ceramic glass. These can still pose a little bit of a risk if people put a hand on it. Um, but the last category that we want to spend the most time on is induction electric stoves, which is what it seems like a couple of you have been familiarized with over the last few years, and some of you even seem pretty converted to choosing this when you have the opportunity. These operate by using electric currents to heat up magnetic cookware and then your food. These uh, induction stoves are twice as efficient as gas stoves. Um, but they don't have any hot coils, they don't have any open flames, so they pose much less of that 
um, temperature hazard that a lot of other stove types do. Um, and they largely stay cool around the pots and pans that you've put on them. The only potential consideration that I will point out, and that's why I've got that little asterisk next to great if you have good eyes, is that there are potential considerations for individuals that use pacemakers or insulin pumps. But if anyone is particularly interested in learning more about that potential and limited risk, I'm happy to provide a resource on that. For the general population though, the um, electromagnetic current that these stoves use is super, super comparable to like a light bulb that you would use in your home. So generally not a risk worth considering unless you fall into one of those very specific categories that I mentioned. And again, I have resources on that. But this is for the folks who are super inclined to replace their stove. The next option that I want to point out to folks is uh, if you're not so inclined or you don't have the funds, maybe you don't have control over your space, like if you're a tenant, another option is to consider trying out lower cost kitchen appliances that happen to be electric and that you likely or could easily uh, own. These things could look like small toaster ovens. It could be a kettle for boiling your water instead of using the gas stovetop. It could be trying out a plug-in induction cooktop, which uh, run much more affordably than their full-size counterparts. So the, the message here is that if you have a gas stove, just try switching some of your cooking events over to other small kitchen appliances that may be able to do the job. Um, the last thing that I want to share with you all, though, is that regardless of what you cook on, there are steps that you can take to uh, make sure that you're doing clean cooking. You can consider opening a window for natural ventilation. Of course, the caveat here is that your outdoor air needs to be ideally cleaner than your indoor air if you're going to open the window. But that does work for a lot of folks just to get some air moving. It's always a good idea to install and maintain a carbon monoxide detector if you're burning gas. And then always run your exhaust hood while you're cooking if you have one. And one way that we can ensure that those vent hoods or range hoods are doing their job is by cooking on the burners that are directly beneath the hood, which often means cooking on the back burners because the pollutants are more easily swept up into that hood than if they were on the front burner where there's more of a distance up to the hood. I did want to spend a moment here and talk a little bit more about why ventilation is important but not always sufficient. And you know, the main one is that not everyone has stove ventilation in their home. So for that reason alone, it's just not sufficient. But past that, a lot of exhaust hoods that are currently on the market are recirculating. I think a lot of folks have experience with these. It's like the microwave directly on top of your stove top has a vent in it that just sucks in the air and then spits it back out into your kitchen. And that's why it's recirculating. Um, so the best type of vent hood is one that vents outside of the home to get those pollutants totally out of the home. But we also have some research showing that exhaust hoods on the market are often not good enough to reduce pollution levels to healthy um, healthy targets. This is especially true for those gaseous pollutants like nitrogen dioxide. But what those exhaust hoods are very good at is sweeping out particulate matter because they have the right kind of filter for that. So no matter what kind of stove you're cooking on, if you know that you're generating a lot of particulate matter and you'll be able to tell if you can smell it and if there's smoke, you should be using your vent hood always. So like things like frying, for example, make sure you turn on that vent hood. The last thing that I wanted to mention though about hoods is that surveys generally show that people don't use them because they don't believe that they're needed or effective or they're too noisy. Uh, my advice here is that uh, you should probably look into the research a little bit more about when they are effective versus not and generally just try to use them as much as possible because they are very good at getting out that particulate matter, but there are some limitations to consider about other gaseous pollutants. So I just wanted to spend a minute there since we had some interest in ventilation pros and cons at the top of the hour. But what I'm going to shift to next, and I'm keeping an eye on the time, so I do want to leave some time for questions, is developments over the last year. I have just a couple more slides here for those of you who are interested in what's new. So what I'm gonna talk about first is the fears over gas stove bans and all of the public attention that this topic got over the last year, especially in the media. 
a lot of you probably remember this, um, but this was when the public was struck with a lot of fear about whether the federal government was going to step in and ban stoves. And this was all set in motion by some comments that were made by a CPSC commissioner that ended up starting a little bit of a media frenzy, a little bit of a culture war on this topic. So I wanted to break down for the group what exactly happened, what the outcome has been, what was actually said. Um, so let me start by explaining who the CPSC is in case you're not aware. This is the US Consumer Product Safety Commission and it's a federal regulatory agency that was created to protect the public from unreasonable risks associated with consumer products. I think a lot of people are familiar with the CPSC banning or recalling things like infant products, for example, that could cause sudden infant death. But this really extends to any consumer product on the market, and that can include cooking appliances. So the CPSC has the capacity to take action like recalls, um, conducting research, educating consumers, but it was one particular comment that the commissioner made, and I have it here on the slide. He was speaking on a webinar about gas stoves, and he said, this is a hidden hazard. Any option is on the table. Products that can't be made safe can be banned. And this is what really you know, struck a chord with the American public and with the media. So I pulled uh, just one article for you all to just see what the media was saying about this, U.S. Safety Agency to Consider a Ban on Gas Stoves Amid Health Fears. Is that exactly what he said? Eh, debatable. But what you can see from the bottom chart here is that um, this is Google search uh, trends over time. I typed in gas stove ban, and I looked over the last five years to see how much attention this got in January and February of 2023. And you can see there was that gigantic spike. And I will point out that there still has been an uptick of information ever since then. It hasn't ever gone down as far as the interest was in previous years. But what I wanted to uplift about this slide is that for the general public, this media attention has meant that now millions more people are at least marginally more aware that gas stoves are something worth paying attention to. There's a lot of discourse that's happened, both swaying some folks toward electric, also swaying some folks even further toward gas than before. But at the very minimum, more people are aware about this than ever before. But in terms of what the CPSC has done, they did open a public comment period last year, and they clarified that any new regulation on gas stoves would only pertain to new appliances. So what I think is important to communicate to this group is that the federal government would never just come into your home and rip out your gas stove. This would only pertain to new purchases moving forward. But you know, in the last year, CPSC has largely kept to themselves about this topic, and there hasn't been a ton more discourse from that agency on this topic because of how much media attention this got. But there are a lot of other health and air quality policy drivers that I wanted to point out. Things like indoor air quality guidelines can move us toward electrification, zero uh, nitrogen oxide appliance emission standards, updates to our building code and energy code, um, can also be um, a key facet of state, city, and local climate plans to electrify our buildings for their emission reduction potential. And then it's also, of course, very important to prioritize incentives for certain communities to be able to uptake these cleaner technologies. So lots of other options are still on the table for moving us toward that healthier, cleaner energy source and cooking appliance. And I also wanted to point out that even though there have been some disappointing hurdles in the past year when it comes to gas stove policy, the ball is definitely still rolling. We have a lot more information than ever before on this topic. I pulled two examples of studies here on benzene and how the gas stove in, or gas industry as a whole has pulled a lot of very similar tobacco tactics to avoid regulation. There's also been a lot more policy. I pulled one example from New York about how they're going to be the first uh, state in the nation to require all new buildings to go all electric. There's also been some policy in the Midwest, in Chicago in particular, the Clean and Affordable Buildings Ordinance would set an emission standard that would essentially mandate 
most newly constructed buildings to require electric appliances. And then I also just wanted to point out that there is always new polling happening on this matter, showing that gas stove owning adults, especially parents, have been showing more and more interest in replacing their stoves after getting this little bit of education. And just to keep us moving here, uh, a lot of new advocates have also joined the space, especially from medical and public health groups. So I wanted to flash a couple of logos at you in case you recognize any of these. And then the final slide that I have for you all on this topic is that there is new funding available through the Inflation Reduction Act's home electrification and appliance rebate. In particular, low income and moderate income homes can get up to $840 to swap out their stove for some type of electric or induction stove, which is a great incentive. It's not quite available yet in these in states across the US, but something to keep an eye on. So last thing that I wanted to share with you all, and before I close, I also wanted to mention that we do have a health working group that operates out of the Midwest Building Decarbonization Coalition. So if you all are interested in joining, please register using the link on the Midwest BDC website. We meet on the second Wednesday of every month. Uh, and we have a lot of fun together learning about this topic as new information comes out. And we also are working together as a group to advance um, our understanding and our policy efforts in the Midwest. So I would encourage anyone who's interested in this topic to join us. And we have a couple of Midwest BDC or health working group folks on this call who can maybe um, get other folks to join by giving their testimony at how the group has been over the past couple of years. But that's all I have for you all today. We only have a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to stop sharing and see if folks want to um, chime in with any comments, questions, discussions. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. I want to hear from you all. And thanks, Tammy, for the testimony. I appreciate it. <laughs> Tammy, go ahead. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I am. Oh, okay, good. Um, so Emma, I put this in the chat earlier and I loved your, your infographic on the United States because that was a perception that was really interesting. Do you by chance have a comparison infographic from any other countries? I'm thinking like Europe, et cetera, because I guess what I'm wondering is the United States behind in our conversion because uh, I, I have a general, my general perception is that, um, you know, Sweden, some of the other European countries are so much farther ahead in their energy efficient um, initiatives and health mm -hmm. and all of that. So where, how far behind are we or where are we in line with that? That's a great question. I haven't seen a comparable map or any data, but I could go digging around to see if I could find a better answer. But generally what I have heard is that Europe is much further along in their transition to induction stoves in particular. Like it is a very commonly used technology in European countries. So when folks over here say things like, well, it's a new technology, we don't know how it works. That's really not true. I just think our awareness of it is a little bit further behind. So we have good examples in European countries and even some Asian countries of how induction has been adopted. One other example that I'll point out is that there has been a big effort in one South American country, Ecuador in particular, to uptake induction stoves. That's been really interesting. And there's been research showing the health benefits of that mass transition to induction uh, in Ecuador. So I would encourage folks to check that out. And I'd be happy to provide that link to the research too. But I'll have to dig around, Tammy, to see if there are any maps or data sources on like country by country stats to compare the U.S. to. Great question, though. I do see a question from Daniel in the chat. Um, can you explain the implications of using ventilation that would place pollutants outside? This is a great question. Um, you know, inside of our home, our efforts are all trying to get the pollution out of the home and to go outdoors. But there are implications of that. You know, we're just displacing the pollution to our outdoor environment. 
Um, and that is another great reason that we should be switching away from the use of any combustion appliances, not just stoves, but air HVAC equipment, our hot water heaters, our dryers, because all of those appliances are required to be vented to the outdoors. And that does have a hugely negative effect on community air quality. It puts, puts all of that um, particulate matter in our outdoor environment. It contributes to the formation of ozone, which is another respiratory irritant. Uh, and if I had more time, I could go more in depth about the outdoor air quality implications. But I think the gist of it is, yes, it's a problem. It does cause air pollution and the formation of secondary pollutants, and it does contribute to health harms like asthma. Um, so that's another very good question. Anyone else want to come off mute and share a question? Or I can keep scrolling through the chat to see if there's any others. Emma, I'm seeing um, two questions in the chat as well. One from Thomas. They're asking if there's population attributable fraction data available for every state. That's a really good question, Thomas. There is not. The reason why we have data for those, I think there's nine states, is because those are the states that were uh, the word is oversampled by the American Community Survey. Um, I can provide more details on this by email, but that's where we have the most information available that let us get super granular state by state for those nine states. In others, we don't have that level of detail and we're not able to do a similar calculation. But if you want like a written explanation for that, I have it somewhere and I could send it along to you. But those are the nine states where we have the best data and we're able to find that fraction number that you referenced. Thanks, Maggie, for bringing that up. Yeah, no problem. And then we have another one I'm seeing from Becky, and they ask, I'm not sure if you are aware, but news out this morning, the gas industry blocked several electrification measures from being in the latest energy code of the International Code Council. Not to put you on the spot, but do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I feel like I saw the headline and haven't had a chance to jump in yet. What I will share is that generally speaking, we have seen a lot of activity from the gas industry, uh, both at the federal level and state and local levels to sort of jump in and block certain um, aspects of our policy work, whether it be code or otherwise. Um, Another example of that is in some states we've had like gas industry representatives join local like public input hearings to provide their input sort of to slow or block um, policy progress altogether. So while I'm not super familiar with the particular question you just asked about the ICC code process, I'm not surprised to hear that because we've seen it happen in a lot of other venues as well. And of course, it definitely happened with the CPSC uh, action on gas stoves as well. So I have some reading to do, apparently. There's always new stuff happening on this topic. Anything else that you see in the chat, Maggie? I'm trying I, to keep up. No, no worries. You're good. I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. Emma, with our two minutes left, um, would you mind maybe dropping some of your contact info? People might have follow-up questions or just ways to get in touch with you directly about this presentation or about maybe joining the health working group. Yeah, absolutely. So if you all are interested in getting in touch to either ask a follow-up question, get a written response to some of the things I just answered, or to join the health working group, my email is ehines at rmi.org. You can also find our registration information for the working group on the Midwest BDC website. So I'd encourage folks to join. It's a pretty low stakes working group. If you need the encouragement to join, I do send a fair amount of emails just to get folks uh, up to date on new research, new opportunities. But if you aren't able to join the meetings on a regular clip, that's also okay if you just want to stay in touch by email. So I would definitely encourage folks to join if you are even a little bit interested in learning more about health and air quality. Awesome, Emma, thank you so much for putting this presentation on for us today. And thanks everyone who attended. Um, keep an eye out in your emails for the recording of this meeting if you wanna share it with someone that you think might be interested. Um, and then I'll be sharing out Emma's presentation as well if you wanna refer back to those slides. All right, thank you so much. Everybody enjoy the rest of your Thursday and hope to see you soon. Thanks everyone.